everybody, and welcome to the Eat What You Grow program. My name is Lisa Howard, and I'm thrilled to have been invited to do this talk for the Shelby Township Library. So today we're going to be making some simple dishes, and I'm going to be talking about the ingredients in each dish. And I've tried to come up with recipes for you that would involve things that you very well might be growing in your own garden this year or planning to grow in the future. And a lot of these things I've grown myself as well. And I am a cookbook author, so I, I develop a lot of recipes, and I love to do these talks and classes. So I will just first tell you a little bit about the ingredients for the first dish we're going to make. Both of these dishes involve yogurt. And one is a sweet dish, one is a savory dish. And the yogurt that I'm using today for both is whole milk Greek yogurt. And I like the Fahe brand, but whatever whole milk Greek yogurt plain that you prefer is great. The reason I prefer to use Greek yogurt is because it's actually a lot thicker. What makes it Greek is that it's already been strained. And so if you've heard of Little Miss Muffet with her, sorry, Little Miss Muffet with her curds and whey sitting in her tuffet, um, the curds and the whey, the whey is that liquid that gathers on top of yogurt. So a lot of times you open yogurt and you look in and you think, that's weird, what's that on top? That's actually the whey. And so the whey contains the lactose, it also, that, so that contains the sugar. So a lot of people who are lactose intolerant they do better if they don't consume so much whey and lactose. So the reason I like Greek yogurt better than regular yogurt is because it's been double strained and more of that whey has dropped out of it. It's been drained out of it. So you get a thicker product that's higher in protein and fat and much lower in sugar. So I'm a low in sugar person and it also works really well for people who are lactose intolerant. So it gives a nicer texture when you're making it with dishes because it won't run all over the place because it's thicker. So we're using Greek whole milk plain yogurt. And then with that, we're going to make a flavored yogurt. We're going to do chocolate yogurt. So the way instead of buying pre-flavored yogurt, I always advise people just get the plain Greek yogurt, whole milk. And that way, you can actually flavor it yourself. So you can buy one product and flavor it many different ways. So today, we're going to make it chocolate flavored. And we're going to do that by using cocoa powder and maple syrup. And the cocoa powder that I chose, this is actually a Trader Joe's one, but you can choose whatever you prefer. Just make sure it's unsweetened. And then also, I prefer non-dutched or natural cocoa powder, as opposed to dutched or alkalized cocoa powder. The difference is that when cocoa powder is made, a lot of times it's put through a process that adds alkaline to it to decrease the natural acidity present in a cocoa bean, which is present in the cocoa powder. To me, I like the acidity. I think it adds flavor. I think it's part of what makes chocolate chocolate. So I always look for cocoa powder that has not been Dutch processed, that has not been alkalized. And you can see the difference when you look inside. So uh, the, the Dutch processed powder is a very dark, dark brown. And then this um, is actually more of a kind of, it's, it's a much lighter color. It's almost like a light brown with a hint of red to it. So that's really how you can tell by looking at it. And then you can tell also by the aroma because non-Dutch cocoa powder is very aromatic and it smells like chocolate. And the other variety, the, the Dutch process, doesn't really have much of an aroma. So that's why I prefer this type. And then for the maple syrup, I just got Vermont maple syrup. I like the, the darker color. It has more maple flavor. So I usually get the dar darker color maple syrup. Usually it says robust on it. That's what I look for on the label. So that's the story on the maple syrup. So what I'm going to do first, and then we're going to put fruit topping. We're going to make a parfait out of it. But the first thing I want to do is just mix the yogurt. And I, you'll see in the recipe pack for this class, I, there are recipes for everything I'm doing with exact amounts. So if you like to follow recipes to, to the T, you can certainly do that. Or you can, this one is such an easy one to make, really, you can kind of eyeball it. So, you know, you can taste as you go. But the recipe amounts are roughly twice as much cocoa as there is maple syrup. That's my personal preference, to have more of a chocolate flavor and less sweet. But that's my preference. So, you know, taste as you go. You can start with this ratio, two to one, and then just taste and change as you go. So I'm going to do a half a cup total. This is a quarter cup measure, so I'm doing two of them to make a half a cup total of the cocoa powder. And then I'm going to do a quarter cup, so just one of them, of the maple syrup. And again, this is a very variable recipe. That's the nice thing about a lot of recipes that are the easy types is you can make them into your own. And all you're going to do is you're just going to stir it. You can also add vanilla if you wanted to. And here's the other interesting thing. We're going to layer this into parfaits. We're going to do a chocolate parfait with some fruit. But 
if you wanted to, if you're familiar with Neapolitan ice cream, so that was kind of one of my favorites when I was a kid was Neapolitan ice cream. And that is, it's a layer of chocolate, a layer of vanilla, and a layer of strawberry, which I thought was very pretty. And when I was a kid, I even had Neapolitan ice cream, astronaut ice cream, which was really cool, I thought, because that was that freeze-dried ice cream. It looked very interesting. And it had those layers of the pink for the strawberry, the white for the vanilla, and then the brown for the chocolate. It was beautiful. But the other way, if you wanted to make Neapolitan parfaits instead of what we're doing today, which is just the straight chocolate, you can do the chocolate layer. Then you can make your own layer that would be vanilla by just using the maple syrup and a little bit of vanilla extract. You stir that into the yogurt, and that's your vanilla layer. And you just do that to taste. And then to make the strawberry layer, you can just stir in, have your yogurt, and then you can just stir in um, strawberry jam. And it's that easy, and it'll make it a nice pink color, and it's that easy to just make up your own strawberry layer of the yogurt. And then you could just pile them on top of each other in a glass. So if you wanted to get really adventurous with this, you could make a triple, triple, triple yogurt layer of your parfaits, but we're going to keep it very simple. We're just going to do a chocolate layer. So I already toasted some almonds, which I just got sliced, sliced almonds, toasted those. So we have our toasted almonds ready to go as a garnish. And then for the fruits today, I found some really interesting things. So I found pomegranate seeds, which are kind of out of season. It's really a winter fruit. So you can find them year-round, though, now, because they've gotten popular enough that stores actually stock them. But uh, they are typically a winter fruit. But I did find some in the uh, refrigerated section of the grocery store. And then I got some strawberries. Now, I don't buy everything organic, but I do buy organic strawberries simply because they're the top sprayed crop. So to me, if I'm going to spend my dollars in one way or another, I'm going to spend it, I'll spend extra for the organic version of items that are top sprayed, and I probably won't necessarily purchase the organic version of an item that's not so sprayed. And the way you can find out that is the Environmental Working Group. So the EWG, every year they publish a list, and they have the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. So the Environmental Working Group Dirty Dozen list is, is a list of the top 12 most sprayed crops in the United States. And then the EWG's list of the Clean 15 is a list of the 15 least sprayed crops in the United States in terms of pesticide residue. So that's what I use as my litmus to determine, do I want to buy this item organic or not? So since they always, ever since I started looking at this list years ago, they always list strawberries as being a, a high residue, pesticide residue fruit, and so therefore I buy organic strawberries. So that's what I have for us today. Apples are another one. And those strawberries and apples are two of my favorites, so I figure then I'm going to get the good stuff. And there are some other reasons, too, I won't get into at the moment um, for buying organic. There's also the workers' health and the ecology. There are many, many factors here. But I just basically, for my litmus, use that, that list. So we have our strawberries. We have our pomegranate seeds. And you can also purchase a whole pomegranate and see it yourself. But again, it's out of season in the summer months. And so it might not be that easy to find a whole pomegranate in stores. So you might, some other reason, just look for the seeds. I actually couldn't find a whole one to show you how to do it today, for example. Now, this is the most interesting thing I found in terms of fruits. This is called a golden berry and also called a cape gooseberry. So this is labeled on this particular package as a golden berry. It's also called physalis, if you ever see it in Europe, which is, I think, the Greek name for it. But this is actually related to the tomatillo. It's in that family. So it, nor, if you see it, I mean, this has already been, the husk has been removed. But if you see it in the store, you may also see it with the husk still on it. And if you've ever seen a tomatillo, the inside looks like a bigger version of this, but green. And then they have those husks that lift off. Same thing with the, the golden berries. They also have a husk, which you have to lift off. And then the interesting thing is that they're kind of sticky. The skin on these is actually quite sticky. So just expect that. There's nothing wrong with the fruit. That is how it's supposed to feel. But when you start to you know, rinse them and cut them up, you will notice, whoa, that feels kind of kind of sticky. That's weird. So I do like to cut out. You'll see that there's a little bit of a stem on top which can be kind of, if, if you go to, to quarter the fruit, and if you find that you're kind of having trouble getting through that last, you know, you're quartering it this way, and so you're cutting through that stem. And if that stem feels a little bit on the, the tough side, I like to cut it out. So it's kind of from one fruit to the next, you may want to cut it out or not, depending on the fruit. But aside from that, that's really the only kind of trimming they need. And of course, if you buy them and the husk is still attached, you have to detach the husk and have running water going because, like I said, they're, they're weirdly sticky. They're less sticky when you purchase them this way with the husk already removed, but um, 
if you have to do that yourself. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing to do. So we're going to use, and the reason that I chose, the other reason I chose, I mean, first of all, I thought they were just basically very interesting, and I wanted to show you an ingredient you may not have seen before. But the other reason I wanted to choose the, the golden berries is for the color contrast, right? So we have the pomegranate and the strawberry are very close in color. So I thought about getting blueberries, but we'll be doing another recipe using blueberries, so I didn't want to repeat myself. So that was the other reason I wanted to get this, this orange-yellow color, because presentation is very important. So speaking of presentation, for this, you can use any kind of pretty container. You can use a, a glass. You can use a pretty bowl. I would suggest preferably make it clear. Whatever you want to use, make it clear, just so that you can see the effect. So I found these glasses, and the great thing is that they are plastic. So especially for the summer months, if you want to make something that has less risk of perhaps falling and breaking on, say, the patio, um, you might want to use something that's plastic. So I'm going to go ahead and use my little measuring spoon as a small spoon. And you can just go ahead and build that first layer in your glass. And then I'm going to add some fruit. Okay, these are actually kind of big pieces, so these are big strawberries, I was surprised. I'm going to just add a few. Sprinkle on some of the pomegranates. Put some golden berries in those spots, and then I'm going to add a little bit more yogurt. And if, again, if you were doing the idea I mentioned earlier where you have the strawberry, the vanilla, and the chocolate, then you would layer that up along with the fruit. Maybe you do a strawberry layer, and then a chocolate, and then the fruit, and then the vanilla layer. So actually, to me, this doing chocolate yogurt this way also and using the whole milk plain Greek yogurt because it's thicker, you can see how thick it is, it's like chocolate mousse. It's a far, far easier way of basically achieving chocolate mousse. So that's another reason I'm a big fan of it. So then I'm going to set in another layer here of the strawberry, another layer of the golden berry, a little bit more sprinklings of the pomegranate, and then we're going to top it with some crushed nuts. And that's it. It's that easy. And now we're going to do something savory with the Greek yogurt. So this is going to be tzatziki. And this is going to be made as a dip or really any kind of a... It, I use it as a dip for vegetables, but it can be any kind of accompaniment to things like a hero sandwich, you know, anything, lamb kebabs. Um, tzatziki is usually found in Greek or med Mediterranean cuisine, so you'll see it served a lot of times as a condiment on the side to use as a sauce, or like I said, I, I like to use it with dip, so as a dip for, for vegetables. So the tzatziki dip is popular in the summer months because, again, Greek yogurt is kind of a co cool summer ingredient. People find it refreshing. And we're going to be using some fresh herbs. So I got some mint and I have some dill that we're going to be using. You could also use dried versions of these. You don't have to have the fresh. But I thought in the summertime, you know, you might have your own herb garden. So you might have one right outside your door to use. So because herb gardens, if you haven't gardened before, are the easiest things to grow are herbs. And then another item you might have in your garden that goes into tzatziki is cucumber although they wouldn't be in season until a bit later in the, in the summertime, but once they start growing, they really grow. But this is an English cucumber, so there's different types of cucumbers. What makes the English cucumber called this, or the way you can recognize it, is it's longer than a typical cucumber. It's a little bit skinnier. Um, the seeds are a little bit smaller, and I find it to be a little bit more crispy. So I prefer this type of cucumber over the regular cucumber you find sold in stores, um, the one that ha kind of has more bumps on it, a little bit of bumps, and this has more like striations. So I like this better because I, I prefer the texture. I think it's easier to handle because it's slimmer, basically. And the other reason I like it, if you are going to buy it in a store, the other cucumbers actually have to be waxed because otherwise they would just rot so quickly that to protect them, to you know, be in a store long enough, they have to be waxed. Whereas these, you'll see, are actually sold wrapped in plastic. So either way, either variety has to be protected. But I like the one wrapped in plastic because to me it's easier to remove the plastic and then wash the, the cucumber and then use the whole thing. Versus the ones with the wax on them, it leaves a bit of a waxy mouthfeel for me in my opinion. And, and I don't really like to peel things if I can avoid it because so many of the nutrients in our produce are found right underneath the skin. So a lot of times if you peel 
produce. Now, some skins you cannot eat, like don't eat banana peels. But a lot of times if you peel produce, you do lose a lot of nutrients. I try to avoid that. So I like these cucumbers better for the sake of the fact that they're just easier to work with. I don't have to peel them. They have a very nice mouthfeel. Now what you can do, you can do this two ways. It kind of depends on how you feel about seeds. You could either just cut them, include the seeds with it, cut thin slices, and then you're going to chop it anyway. So this, this would be including the seeds. Or you could cut it in half long ways. And then what you can do is you can actually scoop the seeds out. So again, it depends on your personal feeling about seeds. So you can just run a spoon along those seeds and then scoop them right out. And especially if you don't have an English cucumber, if you have a more standard cucumber, I would actually advise scraping out the seeds because otherwise it becomes too watery. Now with an English cucumber, they, they, they're less watery, so it doesn't make things as watery. But an advantage of scooping out the seeds would simply be that the, the resulting dip is going to be thicker because you don't have that watery aspect of seeds. So it's kind of a little bit up to you in terms of how you like your, your consistency to be in the final product. So I actually am going to go ahead, I just wanted to show you both ways, but I actually am going to go ahead and scoop the seeds out of most of it so that we have these. And the nice thing too is then you can use them as boats. If you scoop out the seeds, then you can fill them with stuff. So that's kind of another fun aspect. Or like I say, you can just make them small and then chop them. If you want to leave the pieces a little bit bigger for any kind of visual impact, you can do that, or you can make them really tiny. I think I'm going to go ahead and make them fairly tiny, but that's up to you. And you might notice this knife is kind of different looking than a lot of knives you'll see, and that is because this knife is actually a ceramic knife. So I really like it because it's very lightweight. The only thing it's not, it's very sharp. The only thing it's not good for would be something really heavy, like a heavy winter squash, is not ideal to do with the ceramic knife because Heavy winter squash, you need something you can kind of bludgeon it with. And Actually, the way I, I deal with the, the hard winter squash is I position my knife on it, and then I take a mallet, and I go whack, whack. And that way, it pushes the knife all the way through, say, a butternut squash, because trying to just, mm, it's, it's just too hard. So if you position it, go whack, whack. But you would never, ever want to do that with a ceramic knife, of course, because it's more delicate. But for any other purpose, I find that the ceramic knife actually is sharper, it holds an edge longer. So, and it also if, if you do anything where you, maybe you go to your cabin for the weekend or you're gonna take a camping trip and you have to pack kitchen items, the other big, or you're like me and you do cooking demos, the other big advantage of this type of knife, a ceramic knife, is that it's much more lightweight. So, I think it's kind of a win-win across the board for most purposes. So that's why this has a different look to it. Also, this one I used earlier too is also a ceramic knife. So that's why you don't see steel blades at the moment. Although a ceramic knife, you can't really self-sharpen it the same way that you can, if you're, you know, it takes a certain amount of skill to, to sharpen a metal knife, but it's definitely doable. Whereas a ceramic knife, I would not advise trying to sharpen it yourself. I would advise checking with the manufacturer as to their instructions about knife sharpening. So we have our, I would call this, minced. And by the way, there actually is an official difference between diced, between chopped, diced, and minced. So chopped is, is fairly coarsely cut. Diced is smaller than chopped. And minced is smaller than diced. So there actually is a descending scale, which a lot of recipe writers now don't really say that. You'll see something like finely chopped. That's minced. So it's kind of one of my bug bugaboos that uh, people have kind of gotten away from using the, the system of chopped is the biggest, minced is the smallest, diced is in the middle. So I am mincing this. But again, like I said, you could leave the pieces bigger if you want. If you prefer that kind of texture, you can do that. So I've minced cucumber at this point. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, we're going back to our friend yogurt here. Again, it's this nice Greek yogurt. And this, again, the, you'll have the recipe in your packet for this, but it, it really is very much up to your taste buds. So you don't really have to overly measure this one. Depends on kind of how, mu how much crunchiness you want in your dip, because obviously the more cucumber you add, the more crunchy it's going to be. So this is going to be 
fairly crunchy because it has a fairly high proportion of cucumber at this point. And then I'm going to add a little bit of lemon juice. Doesn't have to be a ton. Kind of it's a to taste thing. Again, we have exact amounts in the recipe for you, but kind of a taste, taste thing there. And see, this is when I mentioned earlier the fact that Greek yogurt is much thicker and it makes it more adaptable because if you started with a thinner yogurt and then you start adding lemon juice or any other, you know, very juicy, watery item to it, then it's really going to thin it out to the point where it's going to get runny and I think less appetizing. Whereas, and it's hard to dip something that's overly runny, so this is a better texture. It's nice and thick. You can dip something into it like a piece of pepper or a bigger piece of cucumber and it'll actually stay put. So that's another advantage. So after the lemon, we're going to add a little bit of garlic. Now you can either mince your garlic or, I like to do it the cheating easy way, use a garlic press. Because with a garlic press, you simply press it and voila, you have tiny pieces of garlic, which is, I couldn't even mince it that small if I tried. So I'm a big fan of garlic presses. Takes a lot of the work away. And the nice thing is you can run them through the dishwasher. However, before you do that, you do have to remove, if you've never used a garlic press before, you do have to kind of pull out the pressed piece that's left in there. So you have to take that out before you actually run it through the dishwasher. So just word to the wise there. So we add our garlic. We're going to go ahead and add some salt and pepper. And here I have sea salt which is a little bit of a misnomer because actually all salt comes from the sea. So all salt is sea salt. At some point there was a sea there. And then the sea, you know, evaporated, went away, and now we don't, you know, underneath Detroit, for example, the city of Detroit, there are tons of salt mines underneath the city of Detroit. That's because it used to be a sea. So all salt is actually sea salt, but usually when, when products are labeled sea salt, it's because they have not been iodized. So mo most salt is iodized which is actually a good thing because lack of iodine creates problems with the thyroid. So the Midwestern region, because we don't have access to ocean water that has salt, all of our water is fresh water without salt. So that's why this particular region of the U.S. was called the goiter belt for quite some time because lack of iodine, you know, we didn't have seaweed, we didn't have sea, sea salt and other, you know, fish from salty seas. We just had fresh water items. So we actually had a problem here with a lot of goiters and that happens when you have thyroid problems and your thyroid really gets inflamed and starts to kind of stick out of your neck. That's called a goiter. This was the goiter belt. So the logic with iodizing salt was it helps with that problem. It helps decrease the incidence of that problem. And so that's why now table salt is iodized. So really the big difference is going to be sea salt is typically not iodized. Table salt always is iodized. And then table salt also has been stripped of any other nutrients except for the pure salt, the sodium chloride. Whereas a lot of your sea salts, they come from different areas of the world that have other ingredients in them naturally. So you'll find there's actually a black salt from India and it has, um, it's, it's in volcanic regions and so it has a little bit of sulfur in the salt and that's why it's a darker color as well that affects the minerals, affect the pigment. And it's really interesting, it's called, uh, I think it's called Kamak. But uh, it's interesting because the sulfur in that salt actually has, it tastes like hard boiled eggs. It has a certain flavor to it. So it does not taste like regular salt. And then you can find a lay in salt from Hawaii that's a red salt that has clay in it, naturally mixed in, and it gives it this really pretty reddish color. You find Himalayan pink. Again, that's because of the trace nutrients. This one is actually from Utah. So, and it has a little bit of a pink color to it as well. So that's just a brief primer on different types of salt and why they matter. So it's really kind of up to your personal taste buds as to what you want to do. Um, I like to kind of play with different salts, but you can use whatever salt you like. Now this is fresh dill. If you use fresh versus dried dill or any fresh versus dried herb, really the difference is the ratio. So as a general rule of thumb, an herb that's fresh is about one third as strong as an herb that's dried. So if I were using dried dill, I would only use one third the amount because it's three times stronger. The dried is three times stronger than the fresh, typically. But that also depends somewhat though. If, if, if you've had this herb around for a really, really long time, like a lot of us have, I, I know I've done that, it does lose potency over time. So depending on the age of your dried herb, it may or may not have a ton of flavor left. So when I say that dried herbs are typically three times stronger, I am assuming that that is a very fresh, fresh dried herb. So that may not be the case with yours. But I just like using fresh herbs whenever I can because like I said, you know, a lot of people have an herb garden and 
Mint, by the way, fantastic. It's a perennial herb. I grow it every year because I can't help it because once you put it in, it stays. So it comes on its own, comes back every year. It's lovely. So I'm a big fan of mint. And there's all kinds of different types of mint. Peppermint, spearmint, there's, uh, I had one year I had a pineapple mint, chocolate mint, which despite the name sadly does not taste like chocolate. I was hoping it would, but it has a really, it has kind of purplish stems, kind of chocolate colored stems. So I think that's why it's called chocolate mint, I'm not sure. But that's, that's a nice one to grow. So I really, dill you have to plant every year in this area. In Michigan it is not a perennial, dill is an annual plant. It's more suited to Mediterranean climate, so it's not going to overwinter very well. But mint just thrives really everywhere. So if you want mint, go ahead and plant it. You will always have it. And, you know, we don't use it in American cuisine. We typically haven't really used mint a whole lot. But you find it, it's prolificate in other regions of the world. And so a lot of Vietnamese cuisine, for example, they use fresh herbs a lot. I mean, fresh mint a lot. They kind of use fresh mint the way that, that Italians use fresh basil in a way. I think would be a fair comparison. So there's a lot more you can do with mint than put it in ice cream. You know, the American palate usually just puts it in ice cream that calls it a day. But, or candy canes or something around Christmas time. But this is a, this is a nice herb that you can use in a lot of different applications. I'm just going to put a little bit more of the dill to go along with the mint, since I put in a fair amount of mint. But I found out the hard way, a little tip on the dill growing idea, I found out the hard way that caterpillars absolutely love it because I had a beautiful dill plant one year and I thought, oh, maybe I'll make tatsiki tomorrow. And then I went out the next day and it was just starting to flower, such a beautiful plant, and it was about this tall and I went outside the next day and it was a nubbin. And I had seen a caterpillar on it the day before and I thought, oh, what a cute little guy. Oh, he'll be a butterfly one day, that's neat, I'm going to leave him there. That was a bad idea. I mean, I feel good because I provide a very nice meal to a caterpillar, but if you want to protect your dill, just know if you see any kind of little bug on it, especially a caterpillar, remove the bug nicely. Put it someplace else because they will eat the entire plant overnight. So that's a tip for gardening if you want to have dill in your garden. And so this is basically the whole secret of, of tatsiki, is it's just the, the garlic, the dill, the mint, the lemon, salt, pepper, and then you have your base of Greek yogurt. And that's really it. And then this makes a really nice dip. Like I said, it can be for like a crudité tray with different vegetables, or you can use it on the side as an accompaniment for if you have lamb kebabs, it's really nice with that. Basically anything that you would serve hummus with, serve this with. You probably have both of those with your meal because they are both really complimentary. And so that's our savory. So the title is just tatsiki dip for vegetables or whatever you want it for.